the, the executive agency is not, it's part of the institutions. This is why I was, uh, I was coming in when you started talking about the institutions because I was taking notes after your, uh, and during your speech. Um, we're not a private agency, we're part of the European institutions. The executive agency is responsible for running uh, and implementing in practice, managing certain programs of the European Union. We're under the supervision of the European Commission. Uh, all the, the management level are civil servants, so I'm a typical civil servant, like Rudolf Strohmeyer, whom you met earlier. Uh, but the people that work with me and for me are people from the sector. Uh, and uh, they have been chosen on the basis of their expertise and the experience that they have. And of course, the languages that they speak, it always helps in Europe, as you have come to understand by now. But so I'm the head of unit uh, responsible for culture. Uh, and I will explain to you a little bit. I haven't, you don't have a title for my intervention because something went wrong with our email exchange. Uh, but I would like to talk about the Creative Europe program, if you don't mind, uh, which is actually the official supports funding program for culture and audiovisual projects. And I came in because exactly questions like the one you asked are actually. Uh, also the ones that we are asking ourselves. Uh, my speech will be less funny. I don't have uh, porks and babies, and uh, my English is also less good, so I'm really sorry. But uh, I think also maybe afterwards we can discuss a little bit on these very, very interesting questions. Uh, as, you, as you said, Professor, just uh, now in the, in the wake of the elections, this is really important. And I put on my, uh, I'm a voter, um, so the underlying thesis of Creative Europe is actually that, as you said earlier, the richness of Europe is actually its diversity, okay? And we see ourselves as a very rich continent, in particular when it comes to comparing with other continents where there's a feeling that maybe culture is more unified in a way all a little bit the same thing. Uh, of course, I'm not talking now about global culture, if you will, because we all agree that if we talk about European identity, we will all remain, I will remain a German, uh, and then I'm also a European. Uh, so my, my identity isn't being taken away just by being a European, I still remain a German, and I read the German newspapers, and uh, I'm actually a little bit more interested in German politics than in Belgian politics, for example, even though I live here. It's too many abbreviations. I don't get the abbreviations of Belgian political par parties. It's normal, isn't it? Yeah. So, of course, and then, of course, we all are also facing the, the global cultural for example, as transported in rock and pop music and cinema and things like that. So nobody of us would say, just because I like Michael Jackson, uh, it doesn't make me a non-European. But this is, we kind of try to pick everywhere the parts of the cultural um, pool that we like, OK? The underlying thesis for the, for the Creative Europe program, of course, is, is very much that we believe in this richness. And we believe that it's also, on the other hand, a challenge. Because in order to live together, we have to know each other. OK? Now, I would be tempted very much to react immediately on what, uh, what you have said earlier. Because you can also say knowing each other actually may mean that we can see how different we are, and it may actually lead to adverse reactions. You know, we had a, it's not politically correct what I'm saying, but for example, we were thinking about sometimes, you know, in the wake of the elections, should we, should we always screen European Parliament uh, debates? And then some people said, yes, let's do that. It's transparency, it's great, everybody will be seeing it. And then others that, that were a bit more careful said, do we really want people to see this? Maybe it's 
better to keep it a little bit hidden, you know? So, uh, so this is also a little bit the dilemma that we're talking about. So in Europe, we've gone through, of course, phases of war, where there was intolerance and a mission, you know? I think tolerance uh, uh, is a good thing, and this is a European value, and the, and the European program also consists of the fact that we firmly believe that tolerance is one core European value, okay? Uh, and, and the question that you asked is, does it, does, it, does it include apathy? I take it from your slight little accent that you come from the Netherlands. Uh, and this is exactly the question why everybody's looking at the Netherlands and saying, you know, this is supposedly the tolerant country, and, and why don't things go so smoothly there as we would sometimes wish, we would love to look there and say, oh, look how it works, tolerance. You know, I'm from Germany. We're looking at the, uh, at the, the, the green parties that have always says multi-culti. It used to be, you know, multi-culti? Multi-culti is, you know, everybody lives together. And basically, we're, uh, uh, we don't care what the others do. And then you had the more conservative currents that said, that's not good. We should care about what the others are doing. We have to take it seriously what the others are doing. Uh, but then this may mean, of course, that we may make a judgment on certain things and, uh, and we may have to react on these judgments. Because if we say baby eating is not good, we have to maybe do something about it, okay? If we think that uh, 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 deducting 200 girls uh, is not a good thing, should we do something about it? And everybody would say, I, we have to do something about it. And then, of course, it also depends on where you come from, et cetera, et cetera. But so the underlying thesis in the European Creative Europe program, which is the support for the creative sector in Europe, is really the idea that we learn from each other and that we actually learn from each other by crossing borders. Because many of our creators, many of our artists, and most of our films, for example, mo most of the works never actually cross the border. We are very good at looking at our regional, local, regional, or national cultural works. And we know our artists, for example. But we hardly ever go across the borders uh, and know, you know, how many can name a Belgian pop singer? Yeah, I mean, come on. Yeah? Bombe, yeah. for example. Yeah? No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, how many of us don't know, you know? And, and the truth of the matter is that the European Union, in the beginning, of course, was not, in that sense, a strictly cultural project. It was, it was an economic project, okay? So they started by building, cul by, by, by building economic relations. And only slowly and only with the Maastricht Treaty in the 90s have they realized that there must be something else in the whole issue, and that's also that also our cultural exchange needs to be developed, because we are certain that if we don't cross the borders, we will eventually not be able to live peacefully together if we don't. And how do you get to know the culture of someone? Is that if you read their books, you know their authors, you see their movies, because this transports messages in a way you see their theater plays, you listen to their music, and things like that. Of course, there's parts of the arts are more easily accessible because they're not linked to language. Because what's the biggest challenge in Europe, of course, is our richness. But this richness also means that we have uh, limits. I could not read a book in Macedonian. And I couldn't even read it in Czech or what have you, in any other of these 23 languages that, that govern the European continent. In America, if I may say so bluntly, they all have one language. Or now, um, it's not true anymore because it's Spanish, of course. But uh, basically, you know, everybody understands what we're all talking about. We have this more or less global language now. But how can I know what? what the heart of a Macedonian writer is all about if I can't read the books? And how can I actually know 
not only what it looks like in, in times of Ryanair, I can probably very easily go somewhere if I'm interested enough. If, my, if somebody manages to stimulate my interest, I would go somewhere. But how is my interest stimulated? It very often happens via cultural uh, things, via a book or a movie or a feature that I say, I say, oh, this would be interesting to go there. It's something that triggers me. And this is purely the heart of creation, right? And this is what the Creative Europe uh, program continues doing. It's the, it's the follow-up of the former culture program, because we've had many, many programs like this before. And they were all based on the idea that what we have to do is allow for intercultural dialogue and mobility. We need to enable people with our money, with your money, basically taxpayers' money, to be able to cross the border and go somewhere else. Um, and this is still valid today under Creative Europe. We say, we think it's worth our money that we help works of art and creators to cross the border. Because many people, you know, don't ever get the possibility of, of crossing the border. You may have this upcoming Belgian artist and then you go to Köln, you know, it's not far from here, but it's still far away. And they don't know a thing about this upcoming Belgian artist. And they're only 200 kilometers away. Or how many Dutch upcoming artists do we know? You know, and I go to the Netherlands all the time. But that doesn't mean that I have a knowledge of the culture. Uh, I was in Sweden the other day, and I'm responsible for the culture program. I was really embarrassed. And they brought me to a place full of pictures of uh, people. And I said, oh, interesting. Who are these nice pictures? And they said, it's all our big Swedish artists. And honestly, I didn't know one of them. And I was really embarrassed. It's like, not, I'm not interested in culture. Okay, I could say I, I don't care. But I didn't know any one of them. And this is really what the European Culture Program has always tried to uh, overcome. Uh, and of course, the big program next to it, the sister or brother program next to it, was the media program. I don't know if you're aware of this. This is the support to the audiovisual industry because very obviously, you know, images transport a lot uh, without words. Uh, and this is really the core of, uh, of our European uh, identity, I think. Yesterday I assisted um, um, a ceremony uh, for the so-called Charlemagne Prize uh, for uh, European media. The Prix des Médias Européens, and it was awarded to the European Film Academy. And then they made it very clear again, you know, that the it's it's the filmmakers that can directly touch our hearts with the images that they produce. But underlying this, there's the pure conviction in the EU, and you can challenge that, that we have something in common, and the common thing that we have are our values, and one of the main values is tolerance. So this comes a little bit to, to, to what you said earlier and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to react on this. Um, Creative Europe now that started just in, uh, in January has brought the media program and the culture program under one umbrella. This is because we think, you know, uh, they face the common, they face common challenges. On the one hand, there's a very big challenge about audience development. And this has also a lot to do with the issue that you were talking about earlier with tolerance. Audiences, it's not about just, you know, losing an audience because we know that all the opera goers are 60 plus, okay, and you hardly see anyone below 20, except for the usual opera nerd kind of thing. Uh, and we know, so there's an issue there, but you can have a theater that plays in a neighborhood, and nobody of the neighborhood ever goes to visit this theater. And uh, we've, had an ex we've had an example uh, a year and a half ago in a conference. We had a very big conference about audience development. And there was, <laughs> I keep on talking about the Netherlands, I'm sorry. I don't take it personally, because I think it's, it's a good country. Um, and there was a woman from, uh, from a theater in Rotterdam, and she said, we went out to our neighborhood and actually ask them, 
what would you expect of us? I mean, we're next door. I've never seen your face here, you know. You may be a bit younger. You may not be the typical white, middle-aged, middle-class person. What would you like to see? Because we may also be your theater. And then, of course, you have the reaction of the typical uh, high-class uh, uh, theater institution that could say, you know, oh, maybe they just want to hear popular stuff, you know, like really easy, not intellectual, like not demanding. And we had this very interesting debate between this woman who said, I went to them and I said, what do you want to hear? And then I closed my eyes and said, okay, I probably have to go through this. I have to offer you this if this is what you want to hear, because maybe via something easily accessible, I can catch you. And by the way, catch also maybe your parents to come to the theater once, okay? Um, between this woman and the other woman who was representing a German national ballet. And she said, well, if I ask my audience, uh, yeah, we would always play uh, Le Lac des Signes every day for 365 days, you know? It's so boring because this is all they know and this is all they want to see because they have no idea about, you know, contemporary dance or things like that. So this was really interesting to see how many different ideas we have uh, in Europe also about um, audience development and that it is actually also a way of uh, raising awareness about certain values and certain, certain things that are important in Europe that we want to commit uh, the, the organizations that we fund to, to going more into the, uh, the direction of audience development. And the other thing uh, that Creative Europe also does is that it takes into consideration, of course, everything that the digital shift has brought with it, you know. We're not just sitting there anymore in front of a television screen. I'll be tolerant. <laughs> um, and we're not just sitting there anymore, neither in front of television or in a theater arena. We're, we also want to participate today. You can also produce, you can go home, now you can grab your guitar, you can write a song, you put it on YouTube, and if you're lucky, tomorrow you're a millionaire. Right? If you're very lucky, but it happens <laughs> from time to time. Uh, so people, people don't just consume art anymore. They co-produce, they want to co-create, they want to be taken seriously. We don't want just some curator to tell us what we have to see and what we like and to tell us what the canon is. Uh, how do you say canon in English? Canon. <laughs> uh, then, uh, so, so this is a challenge that both media the support for the audiovisual industry program faces as the cultural program. This is why we have decided uh, to bring this all together under one uh, umbrella. And it started uh, this year with around 1.4 billion euros. And of course, you know, we, we, will, we, we continue funding co-productions, ex common exhibitions that tour. We particularly fund of producing translations, because translation, of course, the book is the core thing, you know. You will never be able to access a book if you can't read the language. Even if you wanted it so much, you couldn't read it. In a theater play, other things, other elements can play. But a book, no way, either you understand or you don't understand. This is why we fund literary translation. Uh, and we also fund organizations that say, Okay, I'm going to make it my, my aim, my objective to showcase certain emerging artists. A very good young violinist, you know, maybe stuck somewhere in small Luxembourg and has all the potential to go out to Europe. I will try and make this person circulate to various areas and then maybe he can get or she can get a contract somewhere else. And this is what we fund because there we believe that also emerging artists, not necessarily only young artists, okay? It could be also elderly people that found their vocation very late, uh, can be emerging, but had not had, have not had a success uh, beyond the borders. And so the program, at least the cultural program, is very open in this respect, but it goes a little bit beyond what we have funded so far. Before that, we just said, you know, how we ask 
how do you think that your program, your project supports intercultural dialogue? Uh, no, 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 we said, do you think that your project supports intercultural dialogue? And everybody ticked yes, and that was the end of that. And in a way, it's also true. Because I can tell you from all the projects that I visited, and I mean, you're also kind of a project like this, right? Um, all these people that have worked together in a co-production or have worked together on an exhibition or on a digital project in a museum or things like that, they will never come out of this project the way they came in in this project. And we're not only talking about the dancer or the director, we're also talking about the technician or the accountant that comes back and says, you know, it's funny how they do accounting in Italy. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not only those where you do the typical criteria, but all those that are somehow employed in the creative sector. And why does Europe care about this? Not only because it's such a nice area. We have very limited competency, as you may know, because it's an area limited, it's an area limited by what we call the subsidiarity principle. You've heard about that a lot, I suppose, subsidiarity. You have heard everything. This Has everybody else also heard about this? <laughs> Subsidiarity is doing things at the level where it's best done, and it's not necessarily the European. Okay, This is also a good message now, two days before the elections. Uh, and of course, this is why we, are, why we are a little bit limited. We're only supposed to fund actions that have a European added value, so-called. We're not supposed to be funding things that could actually better be funded at another level. But we continue uh, funding mobility and exchange because we also believe that, for example, if the Netherlands has such great ideas about audience development, why don't they just share it with others? This is what they should do in a network, for example, uh, and not keep it to themselves and have the poor Spanish reinvent it again while it's already there in Europe. And this is what we're trying to facilitate uh, and also help artists for example, get a little bit more professional because they hardly get any access to credits. So we're trying to remedy this. But this is also because banks say hardly anyone ever comes with a business plan to me because artists say, I don't need a business plan. I'm an artist. And then the banker says, what's your product? And then the artist says, it's in my head. But can I see what you're trying to do? very complicated and very vague. So we're also going there. We're trying to make worlds understand each other that are not normally made for each other. And this is because we believe that there's a very high potential. We know there's a growth potential in the sector. It's in growth terms more than the average in men, than many other sectors in the creative sector. In France, for example, the potential is bigger than the automotive industry. Can you imagine? I would not have thought that. It's more important in terms of GDP in Europe uh, and also in terms of jobs creation. So this is why Europe has said, you know, we want to continue funding this. Now, this hasn't gone down too well with everybody, if I can say this in this closed room, because there's also those that say, you know, culture is just there because culture is culture and we need to fund culture because it's culture. L'art pour l'art, as we would say. Um, and others have said, no, 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 please, you know, have art also and have the creative sector also contribute to other things. For example, to a societal development. By creating cultural and creative awareness, you can actually change a mindset. And in my practice, I've been in this post now for three years, I was most impressed by those people that told me, you know, we've been working together and the, it's also, it's always minimum three countries, okay, for a small project. And then six countries for a bigger project. So people have to come together from these projects and they have to work together. They have to create a partnership. And there's a lot of funny things uh, that may be funny at the beginning and then turn out to be a really awful fight afterwards because there's cultural misunderstandings. For example, I've heard a lot about in, this, in, in the northern countries, if, if I, I'm going to be a bit blunt like this, okay, in the northern and sometimes also a little bit richer countries, they were very afraid of introducing a project 
because they thought, you know, I'm going to do it perfectly. And can I trust these Greeks to do it perfectly? And what if I have the responsibility? Do I really want to take over this responsibility for the others? Hence, they didn't introduce. Afterwards, they didn't like it so much, but be because they never got money out of the program, because the organizations were too, you know, they were too hesitant. And then you have countries, other countries that just go for it and, you know, submit another proposal and another proposal and another proposal and then see what comes out. You know, there's very different approaches in there. But all these people that have been working together for at least two years, this is the minimum, uh, and now it will be even four years uh, that you can actually work together, they will never, they all say, I come out of this project a different person because I will have established real working relations with the partners from a similar sector in another country and I will have understood. And it's also about solidarity. And one of the nice things that I've also witnessed was a dance program where it was quite a big, uh, here we're talking about almost 2 million euros that we supported and that's only co-financing, so it's actually the double. Uh, they had a very, very big and very successful uh, program and then came the financial crisis. And then slowly but surely certain organization just disappeared because the funding was over, you know, budget cuts everywhere. And then they said, what do we do, you know? Uh, do we want this project to continue anyway? And then in this organization were quite many Scandinavians that have a lot of money compared to others. And they said, we want these organizations from the poorer countries, say, we want them in because they can stimulate us in another way. They can contribute to the success of our project in another way than just by money. And this is why all amongst us we agreed to share and then we take over the share of those that cannot contribute anymore. And this for me was really a heartwarming experience because it shows that it's also about solidarity if you can. You can, you can prove solidarity in this respect. And it's also one of the uh, main, uh, main values, I think, that the European Union thinks uh, it has. Uh, now, Creative Europe, and I'm, I'm going to come to an end uh, there, we had in the past in culture 2007, we had specific calls for the cooperation with third countries. Uh, and um, I looked at the figures just before I came. Um, in very plain terms, it was mainly the bigger countries that were also introducing more successful projects with third countries. For example, we had projects with Mexico, we had projects with uh, some Arab countries, we had projects now with Canada uh, and Australia. Uh, of course, they were a bit less difficult because they brought money instead of asking for money. Uh, and most of these projects, even though they were successful, but they were highly complicated and a little bit lacking focus. Uh, and now what Creative Europe has done is that it has stopped this kind of support, but has opened up in theory to all the neighboring countries in the east and in the south. So now countries like yours, for example, can participate in the program and it's a specifically uh, a, a political sign that Creative Europe wants to give, that it has said, it's also the reactions, I think, to the Arab Spring, uh, that we cannot just continue exchanging amongst ourselves, even though we may be foreign to each other, but we have to open up also as a kind of reaction to the thing we often hear, uh, you know, fortress Europe and things like that. This is what we have to make, uh, uh, make possible. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I, I, I've gone away from my, <laughs> from my script because I was inspired by you. But um, of course, I'm open for questions. Um. Hi, my, my name is Lena Campbell. I'm a master's student at the ICD. I was wondering your opinion on um, like some countries like France, they have a quota for French artists, like 30%, I heard. And do you think that's beneficial 
in that uh, it sort of fosters more French artists or would it be more harmful in that then you might not have the variety that you would see elsewhere? And, and thank you for your speech. It was very interesting and informative. Thank you. Um, well, that's really a political, it's really a political question. It's a bit like asking, are you in favor of a quota for women? Which I am. <laughs> but uh, not everybody is. Uh, and I think that the quota uh, is, in a way, a very strong form of uh, stimulation and encouraging of a certain activity. Uh, just like we have the current debate now on the TTIP, as you know. Uh, on the uh, on the trade agreements with the United States, you probably come across that in your days here because it's really a big issue. It's really quota is state organized support for a certain sector because you believe it's important for your country, uh, and this is why we have in the audiovisual directive we have imposed certain quota as well, and we have imposed certain. Uh, value chains, for example, when it comes to the screening of audiovisual productions and things like that, because we believe it's important enough to do that. Um, and now I can see in TTIP, very funnily, and I've also worked, I told Mark earlier, I've worked for the German Cultural Umbrella Organization for a year, and they've always looked at France and saying, you know, we want politicians that are like this, you know, a little bit protectionist, you know, but for the creative sector, it's actually quite nice to have somebody standing up there and saying, you know, um, we want our our production to be to be safeguarded in a way because we feel it's so important for who we are and what we stand for. Um, but of course, it remains in a, a kind of, uh, if you will, protectionist measure. Uh, and you could also argue, you know, this is also the thing about the theatre, you know, do I have to protect certain things or can I just let the market do certain things and then what's popular works and a film that's good will work, you know, a good, a good product will find its way. We had this debate a lot, you know, there are also here in, in the institutions, there are people that say, why do we keep on funding? things like that, you know, just for five opera dancers to meet and two technicians and, you know, they're already so full of public funding, why do we put even more money in that? And you can guess from which countries this kind of criticism comes from. Uh, yeah, basically those countries where they l have a little tighter look at the budget, okay, because they also tend to contribute more to the budget. So there you have also really a difference between north uh, and south in a way, unfortunately. Uh, but it, this is why also now Creative Europe had to be put on another basis, you see. They also had to be able to say, it's not only the dancers moving, and it's not only the violinist traveling. It's more than that, it's a contribution to Europe's economy, you see. And it's also educating, and it helps you know, cultural education is one of the key competencies that were acknowledged as being important for every individual. And this is why they said, you know, culture also serves other purposes than just those that are actually part of a project. It's a, we can talk about that for an hour, but uh, it's a, I'm quite a fan, so. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Loris, I'm from France. Um, thank you for your presentation, it was really interesting. I was just wondering what the um, uh, Creative Europe program is doing. Like, because I, I guess that now um, in our society, uh, culture is, um, is going through the internet and what the European Union is doing like to promote the culture, culture through internet. Um, how does it work? And I there is really something because uh, I know there are still some boundaries with the internet. For example, if you want to see like some TV shows uh, in uh, other states, but sometimes it's forbidden in, in Belgium. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is so uh, you're you're really putting the finger on something which is really crucial. Is of course uh, we have different copyright regimes, right, that hinder the free flow, but that is also for a reason because copyright regimes differ in 
countries. Uh, and uh, the artists may say, are you, will, you s will you talk about that? No. <laughs> so uh, um, it is true, while I said that Creative Europe wants to tackle the digital challenges, while we want to really promote the use of digital tools, etc., etc., use also for new business models and things like that, and also uh, strengthen the competencies of everybody involved in this area. Uh, we, we will always be faced with also, for example, tax issues that are very different from one country to another visa policy. Today I received a mail from a Turkish artist who said, you know, I cannot travel freely just like that among all the borders. But this goes really beyond the scope of the Creative Europe program. I'm really only talking about the funding, but the issue, of course, for the Culture Commissioner is to have an influence, have a mainstreaming influence in all the other EU policies to say, okay, if we really want artists to move and if we really want works to move, we have to tackle these issues as well. So they have to talk to Nelly Cruz, okay? Uh, if they want this thing to, to happen, because it's not by funding that alone that you can do this. But we can facilitate uh, certain things, but they will always be heard where it's national legislation that's not harmonized. And for a reason, it's also discussible. And I think I Let us please uh, express our sincere gratitude to Ms. Barbara Gessler.